Let's go live. We're going live now. We should be live. And we're live. Hello. 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 <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Where are you to join us from? This is Jim McKeith coming to us with a live episode of the podcast at Delphi.org. And I'm just checking to make sure we're actually getting... Oh, sorry, that's my bad. <laughs> ah, so Craig's monitoring us. <laughs> Oh, Jim, okay, great. All sci-fi effects and things going on behind you. You're in I know, isn't that neat? It looks like you're in some kind of machine that's either going to teleport you or turn you into something else. That would be cool. <laughs> Is my uh, audio and video in sync on the? Uh, I actually don't hear audio. Oh. Well, we'll just hope it is. There is definitely audio on the stream, as I just discovered. Yeah, all right, we'll hope it is. So, I, yeah, I'm using a green screen here. And, um, okay, yes, and so I can cut out the background behind me and have this cool uh, kind of sci-fi looking effect going behind me, which it looks appears to me to be pausing occasionally. So, all right, well, we'll try that. Um so yeah, joining me today, uh, down below, let's see, yeah, down below this way is Craig Chapman, and then straight below is David Millington. Hello. And I believe David's able to join us today. You figured out why he was dropping packets. Apparently it was your iPhone. Is that what it was? Well, it's this current working theory. Um, so what I was reading is that... Uh, I mean, I have, have an iPhone here, it's connected to iCloud. Um, every so often it will go and synchronize to iCloud and upload photos or check for photos and that kind of stuff. Um, and I read a few reports online of uh, people finding that it, uh, their iPhones saturated their home network for a few seconds at a time whenever they just went to check, even if they weren't actually synchronizing. So. Um, huh. Now, I have no idea if that's actually the case or not, and it only happened with cheap routers, but I mean, my router here is just provided by the ISP, it's nothing special. So, that is, that is a working theory. i put my phone on the cast, so let's, let's see what happens. That is better right. than what uh, the earlier iPhones were doing, which is not saturating home networks, but the cellular networks, which was a problem for a hmm. Yep. Look, I have to admit, while I'm talking to you right now, uh, I'm watching the drop frames count go up. Uh, so I, I don't know if this working theory is actually a valid theory or not. Uh oh. Well, we'll find Jim, out. Jim, I have an intern, so maybe she can tell you whether this uh, this video is actually coming through or or not. Yeah. So, Soraya, it, let me know if David, which is the guy on the lower left, if he starts losing video. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, my niece just started interning today. Well, we've talked about it a couple of times before, but she's here today helping me monitor the stream and make sure everything's good. So, And then hopefully, I think you guys are probably watching the uh, chat log as well, right? Uh, good point. Yes, yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> you are now. <laughs> I'm now watching it. Hi, Samir. All right, great. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do, actually, let's see, is let's switch over to this one, is today Delphi, well, I guess tomorrow, Delphi's turning 23. Yay. Does so that work? Uh, yeah, happy birthday to Delphi. That's actually a little disconcerting because I've been using it since it was born. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I started I started programming in BASIC like a lot of people did back in the day. Um, and I remember when I discovered Turo Pascal, it was so much better than BASIC. And then I discovered Delphi. I discovered Delphi at Delphi 2. And uh, it was fantastic. And then since then, I've used a lot of other programming languages. But Delphi still is my absolute favorite well, I have an interesting anecdote about Delphi. I, I used Delphi. Well, I, I started with BASIC as well. I had a uh, BBC um, P3 
people in Commonwealth countries might know that, but I don't think it was ever popular in America. And then Turbo Pascal and stuff the same way as Golly might not even if I hate to say this, one might not even have been a teenager in 1996 when, when Delphi was released. 95. Um, and I was using Windows 3.1 at the time, so I, I had 16-bit Delphi. And uh, moving up from, from DOS to being able to I'm using you know, objects and stuff. Um, now, what I particularly liked was that someone wrote a replacement shell for Windows 3.1 called Calmira. Uh, and that was written wholly in Delphi. And, um, you know, back then, as my programming was just playing around and making games and graphical things and that kind of stuff. And uh, um, I decided I too wanted to write a, a replacement shell for Calmira, which was written in Delphi. Um, it was an amazing inspiration. I learned a lot from its its code. My code was terrible. Really embarrassing <laughs> to remember. But I learned a lot. So you know, I just... Not... Sorry, go on. Uh, I was just going to say that I think the rule is is that if it's been more than six months than you've looked at your code, it's terrible. <laughs> well, actually, something else. I, um, uh, I mean, I have some personal projects. You know, I make plugins and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I haven't been able to, to spend much time on them recently. So, uh, uh, you know, just because I, I spend so much time working. And um, I hired a, a contractor recently to, to take over some of the maintenance and fix some bugs and that kind of stuff. He did an excellent job. Oh, good. And, uh, I knew you talked about doing that, so I'm glad that worked out. Yeah. Um, he did an excellent job and uh, found some terrible bugs. <laughs> like, truly embarrassing. <laughs> um, <laughs> now it's older than six months um, some of that stuff goes back several years <laughs> um, but it's still you know, truly shocking uh, to, to think that that you could write something like that it's, it's yep. really okay humbling. so today very humbling. very humbling yeah I'm sure I, you know my generally if I write code yesterday if I look at it today I'm like whoa Man, who wrote this? <laughs> I've had the opposite happen, although it wasn't in. Uh, it was not even in Pascal. It was a, a bit of basic code that I wrote. Um, when I, I wrote it when I was a kid, and just happened to have it lying around on the disk. And I, I couldn't have been older than ten or eleven years old. And when I finally got this code back out, and it's probably fifteen years ago now that I'm talking, but I finally found this code and started reading it, and I thought. This is actually really good code, but I cannot understand anymore what it does. <laughs> I must have been some kind of genius kid because I this is way above my head, you know. Um, so I've had that experience in reverse. Well, they do say that um, you know it's free. I've forgotten the exact quote. There's a very famous quote about that exact situation about writing read-only code and about. Um, I wish I could remember exactly what the quote was. Thing along the lines of, and this is going to be phrased much worse than the the quote, but that um, you know, if, if you wrote, if you write code that is, you know, your most intelligent code, your most clever code, clever is a better word, um, then you're going to have to be at least that smart to, well, probably twice that smart to understand it. But when you yep. read it later, it makes some sense. Um, what it yeah. Is, so yeah, I... the, there's um, I find there's a. <clears throat> an attrition rate on the knowledge that you have when you're writing code. So, for example, the last time I wrote a socket lib, uh, which I still have lying around, I still use it for socket programming. Well, at the time that I wrote it, I was reading about sockets. So I knew about, you know, when I needed to handle certain events asynchronously and when I had to handle events synchronously, uh, what certain error codes meant and so on and so on. When you come back to read that code back, you no longer have that knowledge because it's you know, it's short-term memory, right? It's what you were reading at the time. So you come back and read it, and uh, a lot of things that you just knew you understood at the time are gone. And so it's a, a more difficult to read it back. And it's actually kind of, um, it's an enjoyable exercise because it lets you know when you're reading that code, did I write this so that somebody else could read it? <laughs> Get to test it for yourself. Right. I, I found the quote I was thinking of, um, Brian Koenigan. And, oh, okay. and he says... Everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing a program in the first place. 
So if you're as clever as you can be when you write it, how will you ever debug it? Right. Yeah, he has a point. Yeah. And it's Brian yep. Cunningham. I mean, he's well, oh, yeah. get much better than I, that. I agree. And I, Sorry, go ahead, Jim. I think that... Um, it's interesting because uh, you see a lot of uh, these like obfuscated uh, code competitions and stuff like that, where people get really creative and really clever in their code, and that's an example of code that's not maintainable, right? I mean, it, 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 that is intentionally being obfuscated, but just they're using this clever syntax that you would never hopefully use in production code because it's too clever. Right, and it doesn't clear what it does, and that's one of the things I love about Delphi, is that it's it's a bit more verbose. You're typing a little bit more, but it makes it really clear, easy to read, easy to maintain, which is, I think, way more important in the long run. And of course, there is a solution to the problem that if you if you're writing your cleverest code, how are you ever going to be able to debug it? Simple answer is, as you're being clever, write it perfect the first time. You won't ever need to debug it. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today I had uh, some things I wanted to talk, uh, schedule to planned to discuss uh, web frameworks. So let's see if this is going to work. I, uh, so Ian hopefully. Will... Oh, and Ian, I apologize. I need to get you signed up as an MVP, and I am just behind on everything. But. You are going to be an MVP shortly. You didn't do that yet, Jim. I know. It's terrible. I am so behind on so many things. It is just... is It's it's sad, and I apologize. So I'm blocking part of the screen here. Uh, you can't see the words on the screen. Um, I'll have to work on that for next time. So we're going to talk about some web frameworks and just go through these and talk about a little bit. Probably, I mean, I have quite a few. There's quite a few at Delphi, and I know I've missed some. So... Just because I didn't include your web favorite web framework doesn't mean it's not a great web framework. Uh, but the first one here I want to talk about is Rad Server, which the uh, change we made recently here is that we now include a single site license with Enterprise Edition. So if you have an Enterprise Edition uh, Tokyo of uh, Delphi C++ Builder or Rad Studio, you get a single site license for Rad Server. Um, one of the things that Rad Server part is it's kind of a turnkey solution. It has the um, it ships as a, a executable binary ready to go, and it includes user management and API analytics built in, and then you can then create modules that get loaded into that, that then those modules provide additional REST endpoints that you can use. We also, in 10.2.2, uh, added some updates around the way it generates JSON to make it work better with uh, ext.js and give you more control over the way you uh, generate your responses and stuff as well. And I just noticed I have an interesting shadow over here. Oh, that must be... That's you. That's fine. You're fine. <laughs> I just noticed it showing up on the uh, green screen. That's the thing about green screens. It's all about lighting and stuff. If I turn the lights off, actually, you can see a bit of the green screen behind me. Nope. It's still, still gone. All right, a little bit went away. Okay. So I have two lights sitting here bouncing off. I tried bouncing them off the wall, but that didn't work. So they're just hitting the green screen behind me to... Uh, make it show up appropriately. Anything you got, Rad Server? Uh, yeah, I can probably add something. Um, we've had it around for a while. I think it's good to, to throw a license. Um, but yeah. I, I think one of, the, one of the interesting things about it is um, why would you use Rad Server specifically? And um, one of the reasons there is uh, because it's easier to create as you know, as a package and, and using REST and that kind of thing. So um, what we see people doing is using it uh, as an easy way to turn their existing desktop app into, into a REST service. In fact, I, I think that's one of the main use cases that people ask me about REST server. That's just what I want to say. I want to say you, know, you have a desktop app and, and you want to make it available as, as a web service. How do you do that without sort of making drastic changes? Um, yeah, Red Server is uh, is is you know the answer, the the way to do that. Yep. So, David, um, I'm not sure if you heard or not, but apparently your video is dropping frames, but your audio sounds fine. So. Right. Okay. So it must be that Estonian broadband. Totally. <laughs> I don't know. 
Well, it could be anything. I mean, it's snowing could right be. now. I've, I have wireless internet. Um, you know, could I be found... the version of OBS Studio. Who knows? I found that when I was on... Now, this was Wi-Fi. When I was... My laptop was connected to Wi-Fi, that I got... Uh, a lot of drop packets when I was doing things live, streaming live output. Now, you don't notice it coming in, but just the nature of wireless is not c very consistent. Uh, it's been my experience when you're doing things live, but so now I'm on a hard wire to hardwired internet. So it, maybe it's some combination of that, it's just the wireless is not as consistent uh, as uh, wired. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't even have an Ethernet plug on this laptop. Oh, yeah? Uh, oh, because you got a MacBook. you got to get one yeah. of those dongles. If you have a MacBook, you have to have a huge library of dongles. It's just the way it works. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I only have one dongle plugged in at the moment, and I think that's enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nope, not enough. You need more. You need more dongles! <laughs> yeah. I have to admit, I, I, I have a MacBook Pro as well, which is... Um, like, I'm talking to you on, on my work machine, but uh, like my own personal machine is a MacBook Pro. And, that is nicer because it has more more plugs. And, oh, what is it? Your work machine is it not a MacBook Pro? Um, actually, it is, but it's one of the newer generation ones. Um, so. Uh, oh right, with less. It's a thirteen inch as well, and so they've taken out a bunch of stuff. Yep. Yep. In, in that that size. Okay, so up next I have Web Broker, which uh, is also by Embarcadero. Ships with uh, Delphi, C plus plus Builder, and Rad Studio. And it's been around for a while, and it's still a great framework. I know uh, Craig's a big fan of it. Yeah. You can use it to create RESTful services or HTML pages. Uh, it has this really cool HTML template support you can do quite a bit with. And now it has support for Linux with the uh, new Linux support we've added. I, actually, what I really like about uh, Web Broker is that it's it's about as low level as you can get without having to deal with all the low level detail. So yep. it, it gives you access to all those that low level stuff as well. Yep, yep. exactly. It'll pass all your parameters and your data for you and you just, you know, access object oriented stuff. It's great. Yep. Yeah, I like it quite a bit as well. And then of course data snap, which we rolled out Rad Server. Everybody's like, Oh my goodness, are you getting rid of data snap? No. Snap and enhancing data snap, um, but data snaps doesn't include all the analytics and user management built in, but a lot of the same functionality. There's definitely a lot of overlap there, but data snap is kind of the idea is if you want to build it from the ground up, uh, it has support for streaming uh, data sets and managing deltas and stuff like that, and it can do both REST and SOAP. Um, most people have gone to SOAP REST anymore these days, but if you want to do SOAP, you can do SOAP. And I guess it can do binary as well. So very flexible um, system for building multi-tier database applications. We, we actually use DataSnap internally for a couple of tools, um, which yeah, are important tools. So um, well, yeah, this yeah. is just worth noting because we, we find it really useful. <laughs> that is good. Up next, Unigui, which I know Craig's a big fan of, makes use of ext.js behind the scenes. Um, so Unigui, interestingly, Unigui, the name Unif, I went and looked at some old forum posts when he was first working on it. The original idea, if I understand correctly, and I may be wrong, is that it was an idea of how to integrate IntraWeb and VCL, so we're going to talk about IntraWeb in a minute, into one component framework. So you could drop one set of components in the form, and it would create both your desktop application and your web application. Um, anymore, it, now it's just for building web applications, and it switched from interweb to ext.js, is my understanding. So, uh, the, basically, so it's, it's, it's a GUI build, it's a drag-and-drop WYSIWYG web application development system. So it uses all the widgets the, from ext.js to let you build uh, web applications like you would a desktop application. And we do, oh, you can't see it because I'm in the way. There we go. I have a set of buttons here. Now I've disappeared. So you, we have two sets of, uh, I'm pointing at them and you can't see me point. <laughs> There's two links to some to uh, a couple webinars we did. And I'll post this um, on the Delphi.org page with this uh, podcast. So you can check out these two. Um, I think they're pretty similar. 
uh, webinars on uh, Unigui. Have you done anything more with Unigui, Craig, recently? I have not. I um, So I have Unigui and I experiment with it, but I've not actually built an app or, or anything in anger with it. Uh, in fact, I've been fascinated more so with uh, transpilers. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've looked at those uh, uh, in some detail recently, but unfortunately, uh, at this point, I've not gotten one to work in uh, any kind of sensible way. I know that in the past I've written some code with um, Smart uh, and had that work when uh, Smart was first released, but uh, since then I've not really done anything with it and I've been trying to get the command line compiler from it to work and cannot. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling on technical details at the moment with them, but transpilers are interesting to me because they offer you the opportunity to not be tied to any framework and to write good, clean HTML slash JavaScript code um, in Pascal, effectively. Right. So I did not think these slides through very well. I think some of the other ones I have more space in the left. So the next one's Kitto. Actually, we're going to talk about Smart Mobile Studio later. I don't. There are a couple other transpilers which you can mention when we get there, but... Um, I don't have anything slides for this. So Kinto is another one that uses ext.js, which we did a couple of webinars with them as well. There's an intro and a deep dive. In this one, you use a YAML notation to define the application. Uh, so it's not as WYSIWYG as Unigui is, but also makes use of ext.js. And I figure we need to also mention Sencha, e ext.js on here because uh, ext.js by Sencha is now owned by uh, Idera, who also owns Embarcadero, part of the uh, Idera Developer Tools uh, family of products. Uh, so it's a native JavaScript framework. Doesn't doesn't it? Well, we have support with Rad Server now to use ext.js to build a front end for Rad Server. Um, yeah, we do. We actually extended our um, our Rad Server support in 10.2.3 as well. Yep. 10.2.3 isn't released yet. Let's plan to. Uh, to that's right. Support in, in 10.2.3. We blogged about 10.2.3. That's right. I forgot. So, yay. 10.2.3 <laughs> is coming. I, I never can remember what is we've talked about yet, what we haven't. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I try and be careful. Up next is IntraWeb, which we ship with uh, Delphi and C++ Builder. It's another WYSIWYG system, right, where you can drag and drop the components to build the um, build the user interface. Um, yeah, I've used I've used Interweb in the past. They it's come a long way. I remember when they um, added the AJAX support, right? So that you can have some components that are AJAX that are uh, the stuff executes on client side, right? And so you can get the data without having to do a pull full page refresh and stuff like that. So. Very, very nice, powerful framework. It does ship with uh, Rad Studio, but if you go to A to Z software, they have an updated, upgraded version or a pro version or something like that that builds on it and adds more functionality. So uh, if you're interested in Interweb, certainly take, take a look at that as well. I've used uh, Interweb commercially in the past, actually, to build uh, kiosk applications. Um, probably going back almost 10 years now. I'm showing my age today on Delphi's 23rd, 23rd birthday. But uh, yeah. yeah, very uh, useful framework um, along the same lines as Unigui, I guess, but uh, obviously a different uh, different vendor. Yeah, the um, it's interesting. My my son's birthday was yesterday, and he's twenty, so <laughs> I've definitely feeling old lately. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this one, and actually, I meant to put a link in here to the webinar. Um, this is an open source bootstrap extension to uh, interweb so that you can use bootstrap with interweb. So bootstrap is a um, framework, I guess, put together by Twitter that you can use with um, building your own applications. It's a JavaScript and HTML. And so this lets you add that to interweb to get kind of a more uh, Respon or, yes, responsive responsive uh, user interface in your interweb applications. And we did a uh, webinar with uh, Olaf a while ago, and he showed how to do to use this. So very cool stuff. Responsive, by the way, being a keyword for uh, uh, mobile design. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the idea is that you're 
your web application reforms itself to fit the uh, smaller screens. Oh, hey, my uh, breakfast shake is here, so. What Sorry, you better watch me drink. Uh, it's 11.30. Uh, but I had an early morning webinar, uh, uh, early morning meeting, and then another meeting, and then getting ready for the podcast, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> this isn't unusual for me, unfortunately, to hit the ground running too early in the morning and then later say, I haven't eaten anything yet. What's going on? So, uh, Jim, we just had a comment come through on the chat. Is there any way to increase uh -huh. the audio gain for David and Craig? It's really difficult to hear them. But you are loud oh. and clear. I'm Interesting. Turning myself up as I much can, as I can here. I can turn you guys up a little bit here. Let's see. Well, I have a mic right here, and uh, as long as I put it just out of screen, I can't really get it much closer. Uh, is that live? So it says I've pushed you live now so gosh that's weird because I think we turn mine down a little bit let me do that all right so let us know how that goes um, so next one these are this is the MVC framework by Daniele Tete Tetti? I'm not saying his name right. I apologize. Uh, Daniele has a number of uh, great books out there also on Delphi, so uh, take a look at those. I guess two. Two of them? Two of them. They're, um, they're actually, we should do it. That's our next webinar topic, or next uh, podcast topic. We can talk about Delphi books, because there's a lot of them out there. Um, anyway, so... I was working with somebody that was using the MVC framework. I've talked to a lot of people that love it. I have not used it directly, although I have used it indirectly. Um, I've logged in through a website that was using it for the back end, and the client application was using it. Have you guys done much with the uh, MVC framework? Not here. I've not really used it. I've, I've read about it. Uh, I haven't actually used it, though. Okay. But uh, I like the concept, I think. Um, or any code that encourages that kind of thing is fantastic. Right. Yep. Well, actually, you want to explain a little bit the concept so that we maybe add a little more to than just a link for this? Oh, sure. Um, well, I, I wasn't actually aware it could be used for the web uh, specifically, but um, there's no reason it couldn't be because MVC is you know, model view controller. The whole heap of variations on this, there's MVVC and a couple of others. Um, what they all really get down to is separation between your UE and, and your logic. Um, okay, that's, that's the ultra, ultra fast thing, but basically it leads to, to really good code architecture. Let's you, um, you keep your app uh, logic separate from the UE so you can replace the UE, change the UE, have different UE layers, um, all that, that kind of thing. So uh, Yeah. The one I was using, I guess, I think it was using Bootstrap or something else for the web front end, but it was talking to the uh, MVC framework behind the scenes, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Well, it's a really nice example because you normally have this thing with you know, your app app, which is a desktop app. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so you have something like the VCL, and it's very easy to write code, write in event handlers, and, and so you have this you know, slightly messy architecture. And so people talk about introducing some kind of MVVC or similar framework there. But uh, web is a really nice example because, you know, the UE layer, of course, really can be online, even if uh, the other layers are, uh, are written in Delphi and, and, and run on the server. Now, I, I haven't used the Delphi MVC framework, as I said. I've just read about it. So um, I think I need to, to find out more. I like to think of uh, okay. anything. Yeah. Oh. I haven't used it either. Here's another one here. This is uh, Mars Curiosity. This is another one by um, one of our fantastic MVPs, Andrea. And Andrea. Andrea, yeah. Oops, that's the wrong button. 
went back to my crazy sci-fi background there. <laughs> um, so this is another one, uh, open source framework. It's kind of similar to the, uh, it, it's kind of similar to the idea of the MVC framework, um, although different in that it, you know, it's a way to, to build that middle layer, right? It's the same thing as you do with like rad server or something like that is it's not necessarily building a web page, but it is building a web service that can then service a web page or a, an application. This one, the web hub by href tools is, is one that is designed around building a web page uh, application. Um, we did a, I think a code rage session with them. I should, I'll get a link for that as well for showing you how to, to use it, but let me see if I can pull the link up for this. Um, pubs. they don't have a, um, a live demo here. I don't think. Anyway, so WebHub by HF Tools, uh, another great solution out there for one of our tech partners. Uh, next, we have uh, Elevate Web Builder. Have either of you used this one? I actually uh, did a little I bit with it. I across it. it. It's, um, I believe it's a very similar concept to Smart. It's a transpiler uh, on one end. I so I think. I used this a while ago, and I can't remember now. <laughs> and we did a uh, webinar with them as well, which I'll get the link for it. But if I remember correctly, you're using, it's got its own IDE, mm -hmm. and it's generating, no, wait, is it a transpiler? I think it is a transpiler. I think you're right. Uh, I was thinking it was generating a, no, yeah, it's a transpiler of some sort. So you're dividing the user interface with their IDE, it then has hooks that you can then use to connect it into uh, Delphi, like data snap backends to um, to build the to uh, build the multi multi tier system. So it's very similar to to smart smart mobile studio. They have uh, uh, they have um, their own database technology as well, I believe, and uh, oh yeah, they integrate that in. So I, I think it's compatible with. Uh, some of the older stuff, BDE and stuff like that, but it's a sort of more modern take on it. Yep. Oh, Somebody somebody's door. here, so <laughs> somebody's at my door. So the dogs go crazy. Uh, yeah, so you don't need to learn JavaScript. Uh, yep, you compile object Pascal source into JavaScript. Yep, it's a cross transpiler. I did some work with it a while ago, but I, like I said, it. It, that's one thing I found, and it's kind of like you're talking about, Craig, with like the socket library, right? Is that you learn um, something to do something, and then later you come back to it, and you're like, oh, I can't remember anything about this. No. <laughs> I know I did this. Yeah, I so I liked Elevate uh, Web Builder. I probably didn't give it enough uh, time, so I I'm going to give it my criticism right now, but it's probably very unjustified. Um, but I found that there was a limited set of components and I couldn't figure out how to build my own. And so without being able to extend uh, the, the component set, um, you know, that, that's a stop for me because if you, you've got a limited set of components and it doesn't do what you want, then uh, where do you go? So. It strikes me as surprising. Yeah, right here. Easily create new components. Right. So then, yes, my criticism is probably down to me not paying enough attention to it. <laughs> and you can also load it in, uh, you can create server modules with Delphi right. to extend it as well. Appreciate you, uh, your, critis your uh, feedback anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, yeah, this... It, you know, I've been through so many web frameworks uh, over the years that yeah, I sometimes confuse them as well. So, um, and does anybody even know what happened to Morphic? I heard the rumors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Smart Mobile Studio. We kind of mentioned this one a couple of times. One of the, uh, I, I don't know. I hate to say more popular. It may be more popular. It seems like it's more popular to me, um, but 
you know, if I say that, then somebody else, I'm sure everybody on the call is like, oh my goodness, I've never used it, but I use X that you haven't mentioned at all, all the time. So, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Smart Mobile Studio. Um, I love Smart Mobile Studio in concept. I've not mm -hmm. got along with it well in practice. <laughs> So the idea behind Smart Mobile Studio, like we, we talked about earlier, is it's a transpiler. So you're writing object Pascal code in the Smart Mobile Studio IDE, yep. and it's the code is designed to be compatible with Delphi, and then that code then compiles into JavaScript, and you create a JavaScript application that can then run in the browser um, on Node.js on the back end or other places, and then it has, um, because it's designed to be compatible with Delphi, it has the ability to connect to whether it be RAD server or DataSnap or some other Delphi backend to expose data that way as well. So it, it works as an extension to Delphi. It also works as a standalone system for building web applications. I would point out also that um, calling it a transpiler is um, possibly in this case not really doing it justice. So the Smart Mobile Studio compiler actually has, uh, it, it is a compiler in its own right. It'll, you know, it has a complete AST and it'll generate code on the back um, it, it generates uh, classes in JavaScript builds a you know method table and all the rest of it so it's actually a very capable uh, compiler system uh, where I didn't get on with this product and by all means don't take my criticism as we just learned uh, but, <laughs> but uh, where I didn't get on with this was with the IDE because um, there are things that you know didn't make sense to me in the IDE and um, in fairness to the guys that wrote this, very small team working very hard, but one or two uh, stability issues as well for me. Uh, again, could could just be me. I break things all the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm the same way, actually, Craig. I break things all the time. <laughs> I'm I am terrible about that. And you know, it's it's interesting how often I found that. Um, I'm trying to think where I was going with this. Oh yeah, I was trying to do some crazy low-level thing with Delphi Android a while ago, where I was trying to access some crazy API, and it wasn't working, and I was just getting really frustrated. I'm like, okay, I want to get this done, so I'm just going to go fire up Android Studio and use it that way. And it turned out the API was broken. <laughs> it wasn't that Delphi couldn't use the API. It was that the API didn't work like it, like I expected it to work. So you know I, I, that that happens to me a lot. Where I'm like, ah, this is this isn't working, and then I like try and go around it, and like, oh, it's not what I thought was the problem. It was something, something else. Completely so. different. And I usually, so I found now not to trust um, my antivirus software. My antivirus software is very aggressive with just about everything. So I'll install a product yeah. and I'll try to use it, and it'll be crashing all over the place, and I'm blaming that product. And then I realize, hey, if I turn off my antivirus, does this work? Yes, it does. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it, sometimes if you're critical of stability of a product, it's not actually the product at fault. And I did that one time with, uh, I want to say it was Delphi 6? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. It was some, some version of Delphi, and I was like, oh, this version is so unstable. Discovered, no, it was a package I was using. <laughs> it was some open source package that I was using in this project was just really unstable. And if I installed that package, then it worked great. But the problem was I needed that package. So um, actually, rather than fix the package, I instead wrote a plugin that would work around the issue it was causing. I don't know why I did that way instead, but <laughs> it ended up working. But like so, I said, it ended up being a, some package I'd loaded. So hold on, Jim. You had a uh, package loaded in the IDE. It was buggy, uh -huh. yes. and you wrote another package or a plugin to load into the IDE that fixed the, the bug and the instability that the first package caused. Basically, yeah. Well, <laughs> I have to admit, as, as the IDE PM, this is making me... <laughs> 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 um, but actually, it's a good point, because um, uh, on the subject of antiviruses and that, um, so uh, sometimes on C++ Builder, for example, we get... Uh, you know, uh, bug reports about about the linker. That's about twenty percent of them seem to be caused by antiviruses. Uh, so you you get a crash or something like that, and and you know, it'll appear that the linker is is buggy. And when we investigate, it'll be the antivirus um, hooking in, changing the behaviour. Um, 
you know, all, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah. As far as Delphi itself goes, I mean, it is interesting that both uh, IDE plugins and component packages are all loaded into the whole IDIS. And mm -hmm. uh, it's absolutely correct that any bug in both a plugin and a component package itself, including in a component, therefore, um, can lead to instability in the whole IDE. So we don't have any specific plans for this, but something that would be interesting, for example, would be to try to isolate that uh, a little. Well, actually, um, obviously, something... that's a long way from trivial, yeah. but it might help stability quite a lot. Something I've been working on recently, David, is um, I have a, a plugin that I'm I'm prepping for. So I've written a plugin before. Um, I think Jim used it recently, actually. Uh, it's a form-based resource storage component. So you drop this on a form, mm -hmm. and you can open it up and drop files inside of it, and they get stored inside the form. And oh, uh, nice. yeah, I'm, I'm about to do a rebuild of it, which will also uh, has an option to generate uh, a source code file with a, a series of constant arrays, so you can store them literally in source code. Um, but in any case, uh, what I found is because I don't want to have to deal with the possibility of uh, unexpected interactions between the component and the, the designer, if you like. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm building the designer as an external executable and the plugin or the, the package will just launch that exe and you know mm -hmm. do some IPC communication with it. Uh, because that way, if anything breaks in my design tool, not only does it isolate it from the IDE, but I'm able to debug that much easier because in order to debug it in the IDE, it would be handy to have the IDE source code, which I don't. So, uh, yeah, it lets me debug it easier and isolates the problems uh, to my code and lets me know what's what's being caused by me and what's being caused by your guys, David. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds I, good I advice. Also, I mean, they do basically, you know, the less code you have, the less surface there is for, for errors. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Like, I was, uh, someone was talk, talking to someone recently and they basically said, uh, any code you don't have to write is the best code or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to append what I said earlier about writing a plugin that circumvented the problem I had on the other plugin, if I remember correctly, and this was a long time ago, that what I did is I looked for the condition that was causing it to crash, and when that occurred, I triggered a save, so it saved my work so I didn't lose my work. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Not not quite as fancy, but it worked. It solved the problem. Now Delphi auto saves your work for you, so it's not as big of a deal. But at the time, it was really frustrating. Actually, Camtasia, which I still use a lot for editing videos, has this really annoying bug that, and I I usually am pretty good at about it. But if you open up a project and start editing, or you start a new project, throw some video into it and some overlays, and, and do your editing. And I get all the way to the end, and I'm like, I should render. I'm like, oh, wait, before I render, I want to save my work just in case something happens. I'm not sure what it is, but if I do that, every time it crashes and doesn't save my work. <laughs> so I have to save my work before I start working on it. Save the project before I start working on it. If I save it first, and I'm not saving it as a new project, then it works fine. I'm not sure if it's the um, mixing multiple media files into it or what it is. But as soon, if I go through the whole process of editing it before I hit save, it crashes every time. And it's very frustrating. So I'm going to endorse a product here for you, Jim. I know that this isn't the topic of this uh, podcast, but <laughs> we, since we moved on to Camtasia, there's a product that I got marketed uh, by Wondershare is the company, I believe, and it's called Filmora. And it's designed really to for home movies, you know, edit, editing your... Uh, uh, regular snaps and what have you um, but I found that it's as capable as Camtasia and it's less expensive and it has a lot more uh, features that you, I mean, you can download and add additional effects into it now to be fair I haven't actually got the latest version of Camtasia I'm several versions behind because uh, I have the one supplied to me by M. Babadero but uh, yeah Filmora has worked out real well for me and I think I spent about 50 or 80 bucks on it it's not bad at all so I do have uh, um, Adobe Premiere as well through Creative Crowd Cloud because unfortunately that's the only way you can get Photoshop. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, so I haven't used uh, Adobe products in a long time because they were uh, on the high end uh, of affordability, and then they went subscription model, which I really didn't, didn't get along with. So. Yeah. I still interesting. I, I, I still like uh, indefinite licenses. I'll pay for the updates when I'm ready for them. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of the industry is going that way. So just a question about Filmora, there is that uh, Windows only, or Mac only, that's or that's a good uh, what, question. What plus support? Uh, let's take a look. Uh, Jim's actually on the website right now. Filmora for Mac. They have it for Mac. Oh, uh, yeah, right. yeah. Mac and Windows both. Yeah. It's a it's, oh, it's that out then. pretty decent. Oh, downloading is being apparently it goes through some sort of. Um, tracker for the download and my ad blocker is blocking it. <laughs> it's being suspicious. But it has a built-in uh, what's interesting is so it has some vector graphics built in and ah, uh -huh. uh, you can basically, so what I wanted was the ability to label things and honestly the vector graphics could be better in this tool but you have the option to download from their sort of built-in stall additional mm -hmm. vector effects and uh, various other things. They really recently released a tool which I think is using AI, um, but what it does is you can select any item in a photograph or a video, and it will remove that one item. So, you know, you've got a bird flying by in the background, you can remove the bird or you know, whatever, or you can you know do the reverse and isolate that one item. Uh, so the, looking at the demo reel for that, I think they must be using some kind of AI to pull that off because I can't see how they would do that algorithmically. The data just isn't there. So yeah, they're quite impressive in terms of what they're, the, you know, the features they're adding and what they're doing, especially for the price. That's cool. That's very cool. So what? Not only is Adobe products expensive, but man, they are complicated. <laughs> yeah. So the last I, one I used was After Effects, and quite frankly, you know, I I opened it up, I looked at it, and thought it's been about six months since I used this. I can't remember what any of these million buttons do. <laughs> Yep. I got some big shadow here now. See, my light's not hitting enough. What's going on here? That's weird. All right. My batteries are dying on my lights. I got battery powered lights. It was probably not the best plan. Uh, they were cheap, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the last one here is uh, Immort Mott Framework by Synops. And this was one I had not included. I looked at this a while ago. But I hadn't have not used it, and I'd left it off the list because I'd forgotten about it. And then, of course, two people commented, "What about this one? This one's great." And I'm like, oh, "Okay, sorry, sorry." So I put it on the list. Um, I have not used, like I said, I looked at it a while ago and have not used it. Let's go out here to the web page here. Um, you know what? Actually, I was using some other code by Synops recently. What was I using? Are you sure it's Synops or Synapse? Mm, maybe Synapse. Uh, Synapse is uh, quite a commonly used TCP framework, and they have uh, serial port stuff as well. That yeah, maybe that's what it was. All right, I'm not going to Google it right now. Um, at least Synops or Synopsy. Synopsy for the yeah, if that makes uh, Immort Mot. I'm not sure. M. I, I, I pronounce it Mormot. Mormot. Uh, Mormot. But, oh, uh, Mormot. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> could be based <laughs> on the animal, perhaps. So I, I have to admit. Yes. I think you're right. <laughs> I'm not certain. <laughs> Getting the animal correctly, because I've, uh, I've, I've never seen, seen a, a Mormot, if that's what it is, in, uh, in life. Well, we always called them um, marmots. But that's not the, looking at the way it's spelled. That's not probably not the right pronunciation either. Those are marmots. So anyway, um, open source components. Anyway, so that's the the la I think that's the last one I had in our list here. It is. So those are the 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 open source not the open source the web frameworks for Delphi that I listed. Anything? Can you think of anything I missed, Craig or David, that should have been on the list? Uh, not off the top of my head. No. 
It was a uh, interesting collection. Thanks for thanks for running through it. Yeah, and actually, I have. Let's see if this is going to work here. So, Craig, uh, I can hear your uh, your keyboard. No, they can't. Ah. Uh, so I do have a video here. Okay, it's finally downloading from uh, Glenn that he put together on Smart Mobile Studio. Um, when he saw I was doing this, he's like, "Hey, I uh, have a video. I want to do a video for you on Smart Mobile Studio. So let me get that downloaded real quick." And actually, I think. Uh, Let me look real quick. Ah, all right. I don't know if I'm going to... So I got one from Andrea as well, and he sent it to me an hour ago, and I missed it in my email because my email is just a crazy mess. So this is... Uh, I don't know that he's going to have uh, audio. You guys probably can't hear the audio of what he's saying right now, right? I cannot know. All right. So you're showing how to install it here. Oops. Let's get that back. Full screen. And I will put the video here in the... In the chat window here. And I will include the uh, the link here on the replay as well, so that you can uh, on the page, so you can grab that. So I do know that the video, although it has no audio, uh, is using the IDE Dark theme, which is rather nice. That's true. I I like the IDE Dark theme quite a bit. Although I think I'm using a modified version of it to be honest now, which is nice that I can do that. I can be using the charcoal VCL theme and then a different uh, editor theme. Oh, right. Well, it is customizable. I mean, we we only support the the two themes that the ID has by default. Um, you know, light and dark. But, you know, you can use some VCL theme with, with ID if you want. Yep. Oh, you know what? I think I can do this. Um, boom, 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 boom. I f knew I had uh, upload videos. Oh, shoot, that's not going to work. All right. Uh, oh, wait, here we go. Link. Is that going to work? Okay, yeah, I can play this straight through uh, Go Lightstream. And that, that was what I was planning to do, but. I forgot. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, send to live, and can I play this? Nope, that's not playing. Mars and my dog just came down to say hi and uh, so that you can check those out and uh, watch those videos and check out those those frameworks those are great great tools that are available for you in uh, your web application development uh, apologies I did not get them posted earlier so that I can share them on the thing but uh, so but I will get them on they'll be on the web page if you go to Delphi.org you can find the link for that and I'll put the link to Delphi.org in the uh, in the YouTube description as well. And now there's a comment here about doing a shared hosting with a, a Delphi built application. Yeah, so basically uh, discussions coming up in the chat here regarding which is the best option. And of course that depends on your uh, particular needs. 
for example, um, SMS generates JavaScript. Uh, that JavaScript can be run either in the browser, so you can build a client app with it, or it can be run on a Node.js installation, which potentially could be uh, shared hosting. So if you're building a client-only app, which um, actually a large amount of the functionality that uh, you get, uh, that you might need, uh, could be client-only, like if you're connecting to third-party REST uh, services and so on. So uh, shared hosting is an option with Smart Mobile Studio and I think with Elevate as well, because they both generate mm -hmm. JavaScript and or HTML. So all you do is upload that to your shared hosting site and, uh, and away you go. That doesn't preclude you from writing server-side code with them because if you have a shared host that supports Node.js, then you can run Node.js code with them as well. Um, Unigoo is great if you want to use um, binary on the server-side, connect to Firedax services, that kind of thing. Uh, so you can build mm -hmm. your services that way. Uh, but yeah, it really depends. There's, there's no one, uh, one shoe that fits all uh, feet. It, it really depends on what your requirements and uh, capabilities are. Exactly, exactly. And I believe, and I can't remember if I've tested this or not, but if you do a CGI, you can do a CGI on shared hosting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, depends on the shared hosting platform. Post, yeah. Um, it, yeah. Typically, um, typically there are scripting engines on the shared hosts. Uh, so you'll get PHP, Node.js, maybe a Python or Ruby or something. I, one of these languages I don't really understand or use. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, you get these options and even some of them even still support ASP, believe it or not. Um, but the, those that support the scripting languages tend to do that to avoid allowing um, is appies and CGI's because yep. they don't want to have to run the risk of putting binary code on their servers. Um, but right. you know, vir virtual hosts are ridiculously inexpensive now. Um, they're about as inexpensive now as web hosting used to be. Uh, so really, if yes. you're building web applications, there's little reason to go for shared hosting. But if you don't need a server, then you know shared hosting costs nothing. I believe you can get it for free in a lot of places. Yep. So this is my dog, Bo. He came to say hi. He just got a haircut. <laughs> He's a Cocker Spaniel. Cocker Spaniels, they don't shed as much, and their hair keeps growing, so you have to give them a haircut. So my wife just gave him the buzz clippers and buzzed it all off. So He's a little chilly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, with, with that pet, it's a good job. Uh, I don't live in your neighborhood, Jim. My dog would eat yours, I'm afraid. Uh, well, I have three dogs. The other one is a medium-sized dog. Okay. This is the small dog. They have a smaller dog, too. Uh, I used to have Great Danes. Jim wins the internet. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Great Danes. I think yes. For a very, very brief period, uh, my parents owned a, a Mastiff, and yeah, that's not fun. No. Well, really, I, I like Great Danes. They're great. I've not had a Mastiff, though. Big dogs, big dogs right. are good, but they... Okay, so there's, there is an incident in my past, not with that particular uh, Mastiff, but with a uh, dog that we were pet-sitting. Uh, there's an incident in my past where two early teen boys, myself and a friend, are on the end of a tow rope being dragged down the street by a bull Mastiff. These things are huge. <laughs> Yes. So Rebecca just said, Great Danes are the best. That's what her dog is. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, so I grew up with a Great Dane. And then um, my dad had Great Danes after I moved out. Then I always would go to visit him. And then I've had, I think, three Great Danes over the years. Um, unfortunately, they're uh, having them early on when I was renting and stuff like that occasionally. You know, I have to move, and I couldn't keep them, so I have to rehome them and stuff like that, which is hard. So it's great now that that's not something I have to worry about because I hate having to rehome dogs. But, uh, the yeah, I love Great Danes. Great. Wow. Rebecca's Great Dane is 135 pounds. Black and white Great Dane is very sweet. The Harlequins, I think, is what the coloring is called. I love those. Okay, so it is... It's 135 pounds. That's what, 70 kilos? Yeah. Uh, yeah, big dog. It's, uh, it's as much as a human. Yes. <laughs> it is. 
And Great Danes think they're they they think they're human or a lap dog, one of the two. They either want to sit in your lap or they want to sit next to you on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> they're very lovable. They're great dogs. I love them. They they tend to be very well tempered as a, a breed, don't they? Yes, they do. Yep. Well, it's top of the hour, so uh, you can find out more and uh, uh, on uh, Delphi.org. I'll put the link in the YouTube video description replay where I'll have the links for the other videos where you can come out and check those out as well. I meant to include them in the stream, and I spaced it. I apologize. So, uh, But you can check those out. And, uh, oh, Craig, you had some cool thing you were going to show us, didn't you? Um, or did you break it? I, I broke it. Um... <laughs> watch, watch, watch my blog. I'm posting it tomorrow, so I'm, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it is briefly. So um, a lot of the time, I'm, I, when I watch YouTube videos um, explaining things, you'll see the presenter illustrate on the screen, and they're using like a Wacom tablet to draw in some mm -hmm. package. Well, I don't have one of those tablets, and um, I don't see any good reason to go out and buy one for the occasional use I would get from it. But I wrote an app once where I could use a cell phone uh, to draw things and then using app tethering, project what I'm drawing onto the screen. And I didn't keep the source code. It was an afternoon project and I threw it away. But I also have a Samsung with one of these real fine, I mean, I've got it right here actually, it's an old one. This was my phone for a while. Uh, it has these really tiny fine uh, styluses. Get that on the camera. So yep. you can actually draw quite uh, quite accurately on the screen of these things and of course I've got the seven inch tablet as well in which a finger will do uh, and so I'm rebuilding that app basically I'll be able to put uh, an image on the screen draw on it scribble on it all using uh, app tethering and it will be going up on my blog hopefully tomorrow if I get it finished uh, and uh, source code included cool so. very cool yeah bit of fun you, you should make it so that you can plug it into OBS so that you can, like, draw over your video or something like that. Well, actually, yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm already uh, I'm way ahead of you. So um, Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm, so I'm not going to uh, try and import, like, a video capture into the screen or anything. Um, there is a possibility. I know how to do it on Windows. I don't really want to have to worry about how to do it on Mac. So it may be a Windows-only feature. There is a possibility that I can grab the desktop, whatever's on the desktop. So... You know, I can open up like a PowerPoint or whatever and look at it. But the simplest way of doing it is to just have slides as images, a deck that I can flick through in the app, and then have OBS capture the screen that I'm drawing to. So I'll be able to draw, mm -hmm. uh, you know, onto slides and presentation slides and things like that. So PowerPoint slides and what have you. Okay, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah that'd be cool. you know, maybe I could have... Um, a window showing the stream that I'm sending using VC, VLC or something and just draw over that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, way ahead of you. Already thought of that feature. Cool. So, okay. All right. Well, I'm definitely interested in checking that out. That sounds cool. Well, and with that, we're going to wrap it up. So happy birthday tomorrow, Delphi. And hopefully everybody else is going to be uh, sharing some Delphi love and talking about what they think is great about Delphi. I do have a video that I'll publish tomorrow on why I love Delphi that I just put together last night They're using my new green screen too. So you'll see this cool background in that video. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's that's uh, all we have for today. So thanks a lot and we'll see you all next week. I think next week we'll talk about Delphi books and other cool developer books. Let's throw in some C++ as well. Okay, fine. Just, so Plus, I mean, it's very easy for me when I'm sitting here because I can just turn around and, and pull some off my, my book off to, to show everyone. Yeah, that's true. You do have a, a good-looking library there. It's too, Actually, small. If, if, too small. I need more books. I can, yes, I can pick always. out a Delphi book on your shelf just by the color scheme. I can see it right there on the top shelf. Oh, really? Which, which one's that? I think it's the blue and white. Is oh, yeah. the user manuals up there? Yeah. Ah, that is the Sea Builder Six Developers Guide. There you go. Yeah. I knew it was uh, the Sea Builder. Cool. All right. Fan I, you know what? I actually got rid of. I had some old paper developers guides, and I gave them to another Delphi developer a while ago, just because they were taking up space, and I didn't think I needed them. And now I'm like, ah, I wish I still had those.
Do you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to make a game of this now um, because I'm looking at all of David's books and trying to identify them. So uh, <laughs> let's make it a competition. If you identify any of those books, go ahead and drop a message in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Well, here, let's put a big picture of David here so everybody can see your uh, your uh, library of books there and then everybody can try and pick out I see oh I can actually even though I've got this little tiny preview window I can read the C++ and a couple other things there I believe I can read one that says oh. MATLAB I, I think that's MATLAB yeah that's why I thought it said MATLAB oh there. it doesn't MATLAB, once you no, send it in I, I don't oh. have a MATLAB book um, no now the screen's so she, in I can see it's not MATLAB a lot of those books are discs as well they're, they're not actually um, technical books but the ones sort of uh, I don't know. Well, the top shelf ones are, and then half the shelf just under under that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, technical books. So. Cool. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap yeah, it up. Write it in the chat. I'm not sure if we have a prize for it. We'll. Uh, or you can comment comment on the Del or something. Yeah, comment on the Delphi.org page if you can think you recognize them too, and we'll uh, comment on today's video or on the YouTube, and we will. Uh, yeah, we'll let you know if you're right. At least. Not even a copy of a Peter Norton book for nostalgic reasons. Yes. You know, I gotta no, look because I inherited a box of Delphi books from my dad, or from Turbo Pascal books from my dad, um, recently, and I was digging through those, and I found inside one of the Del the Turbo Pascal books a Turbo Pascal one floppy, well, and it was weird because it doesn't say Turbo Pascal one; it just says Turbo Pascal. For uh, MS DOS, it doesn't say one, but the release date lined up. <laughs> That's how I figured out it was version one, because you know version one doesn't say version one; it's just the version. So I have that someplace. All right. Well, with that, we're going to go ahead and close since we're now twelve minutes past. So thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Marashi. See you next week. <laughs>